Hi everyone to today's uh, Applying Ethology webinar. Um, before we start with the webinar, I would like to um, quickly recap uh, our housekeeping rules. Um, first, when you enter the room, please take care that your microphone is turned off and your camera is turned off to have the presentation run as smoothly as possible. Um, and second, if you have any question for the speaker, please feel free to virtually raise your hand after the presentation or drop your question in the chat and the moderator we will read out your question after the presentation. Uh, with that, I'm uh, very glad to introduce today's speaker, Desiree Pux. She is currently a postdoc at the University of Gießen in Germany. Um, she's going to talk a little bit today about uh, some rather uh, unusual domestic model species and their behavior in a uh, spatial detour task. Uh, Desiree's background is, uh, or she's coming from work on parrots. So she was working on parrot cognition during her PhD, then went on to work with wild deer, so non-domestic animals as well, and now ended up uh, having uh, a range of exciting projects coming together with farm animals. And uh, this is, I think, one of the earlier works from her at the University of Gießen, and I'm very happy to have Desiree today here. Desiree, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Christian. Yes, today I want to talk about a project that we did last year, and we looked at whether llamas and alpacas would learn socially from humans, but also from conspecifics in a detour task. Okay, so animals are confronted with many novel aspects in their daily environment, like for example, a dog meeting a porcupine for the first time, or a juvenile animal meeting a predator. And so while a dog might um, interact with this porcupine only once and will end up really badly, um, such an interactions with, uh, with novel aspects of the environment might um, be rather um, problematic in other instances, like for example, the juvenile antelope. And so while the majority of such interactions with novel aspects of the environment are guided by trial and error learning, meaning that the animals try it once and then they learn that it's bad and um, yeah, acquire a novel behavior. In other instances, such as the juvenile antelope and the lion, this might end up very deadly. And um, so trial and error learning might not be beneficial in all instances. And um, it has been proposed that social learning, so learning from observing others performing behaviors, is beneficial in very costly situations or also in very unpredictable situations that um, yeah would be or that might not work with trial and error learning to begin with. So learning by observing others is termed social learning and it is found in various species across the animal kingdom. So for example, capuchin monkeys learn how to extract food by observing others cracking open nuts, for example. Our pigs learn where to find food by observing the mother's chick in particular areas and then feed there as well. Other individuals, such uh, other species, such as meerkats, for example, learn to avoid predators just by sharing vigilance with more skilled conspecifics. And also, also, and this is a rather special case, for example, dogs might learn how to use human behavior in order to find food. So there are very, or various different ways of how information can be acquired in a social context. And such um, types of social learning have been categorized in different um, subsets. So one end, on, on the one hand, imitation can occur. And this is the case if a demonstrator's behavior is copied exactly the same way, like using the right hand to perform this behavior and then end up with food, for example. Another form of social learning, which is not that strict in a way, is called emulation. And in this, um, or if emulation occurs, the same goal is reached, but it might be reached using a different behavior. Um, there are other forms of social learning as well, um, which are only indirectly social because um, the behavior itself is not learned from a demonstrator, but rather from the presence of it of a demonstrator. And one such thing is local enhancement learning. And here um, the observer is um, yeah, intent and or is um, observing a behavior that is occurring in a particular area or in regard to a particular stimulus. So only this presence of a conspecific in this area is drawing the attention towards this area, but not the behavior per se. 
Another type of social learning is so-called social facilitation. And here, the only the presence of conspecifics is facilitating behavior um, that might occur in this context. And um, yeah, as I said, I drew this line here, local enhancement and social facilitation are only indirectly social, but um, imitation and emulation are considered true social learning. And as you might guess, um, imitation and emulation are cognitively more demanding compared to local enhancement and social facilitation. And I want to come back to this example down here, as learning from humans might be very beneficial for domesticated species, or um, rather learning from heterospecific. So one question that arises, is this something special or can we find it also in other species, not just learning from humans, but learning from heterospecifics. And um, indeed, as you might imagine, animals do not exclusively inhabit areas with conspecifics. There are also always other species around. And so it might be that other species that face, for example, similar ecological challenges might also potentially serve as sources for information. And the same has been observed in various species. For example, in terms of predator recognition, it has been shown that uh, superb fairy wrens, which you can see in the top picture, are able to learn socially about alarm calls from other bird species about certain predators that are potentially harmful to those birds. Additionally, heterospecific social learning might occur in terms of locating food. So it has been shown that hyenas learn to use circling vultures or across or above carcasses in order to locate food. And if you think about it, this saves a lot of time for the hyena and um, also energy because they do not locate, need to locate the food on their own. Additionally, in the context of habitat or nest site selection has been shown that, for example, certain birds rely on the density of other birds in order to um, or as an indicator for good habitat quality. So if lots of these one bird species are present, then it's an indicator that the, the habitat is likely good. So um, given that heterospecific learning seems to be common across the animal kingdom, the question obviously arises, what about domesticated animals? Considering that the domesticated animals live in a human dominated environment, it might be very possible or it might even beneficial for domesticated animals to also use human behavior as a source of information. Um, and indeed, it has been suggested by various different domestication hypotheses that domesticated animals are particularly skilled in reading, understanding, reacting to very subtle human behavior. Um, including, for example, human gestures or sensitivity to human emotions or referential communication, just to name a few. And if you think about it, this makes a lot of sense because humans make up a big part of the social environment for domesticated species, at least. And so being sensitive to this human behavior or these human social cues might increase domesticated animals' fitness in this human, domina human dominated landscapes. And so it might be beneficial for horses, for example, to um, follow humans around or learn to navigate the environment. Whereas it might also be beneficial for dogs, for example, to learn where to find food just based on human behavior. Additionally, like in the goat example, it might be beneficial to observe humans, how they solve problems like opening doors in order to get faster access to food. And indeed, several studies have shown that domesticated species are able to use human social behavior as a source of information. So for example, dogs are very good in solving problems after having observed humans solve a problem. Similarly, goats and geese were able to learn socially from human demonstrators. With horses, the case is a bit mixed. Some studies showed that horses are able to learn socially from humans, whereas other studies have shown that this is not the case. And also lining up with these um, domestication hypotheses, um, parrots, for example, but also chimpanzees and dingoes were not able to learn socially from human demonstrators. Um, so the question arises, um, or sorry, coming back, such an interspecific information transfer might be very important for successful human interactions. And um, 
with this study that I'm going to talk about now, we wanted to find out whether the same is also true for other domesticated species that have not been tested so far. So is it that all domesticated animals are able to learn from humans, or is it only those that were selected for particular traits? So phrasing it a different way, is domestication per, domestication per se causing a sensitivity to human behavior, or is it rather the selection for particular production traits, such as cooperative behavior, for example? And one interesting model tax on this regard um, is the or other new world camelids, the so-called lamini. And as the name already suggests, they um, originate in South America and consist of two species. On the one hand, the guanaco, which you can see on the left, and the vicuña, which is shown on the right. And they share a similar habitat. They're found in very high Andean regions and um, yeah, share a similar or share similar ecological pressures and show similar social behaviors as well. And um, those two species shared their last common ancestor around two to three million years ago. And the interesting part about these two species is that they've both been domesticated. The guanaco was domesticated and the llama resulted. Um, this happened around 3,800 to 5,000 years ago. On the other hand, the vicuña was also domesticated, and here the alpaca resulted. Um, the alpaca was most likely domesticated around 6,000 years ago. So given that um, vicuñas and guanacos uh, share habitats and are also really closely related, um, they likewise show a very similar feeding ecology, so which means that they're mainly grazers, and they also share a similar social organization. Um, both vicuñas and guanacos and also alpacas and llamas live in territorial family groups. Um, both llamas and alpacas continue to play a very important role as livestock animals in South America, but they've been domesticated for very different reasons. On the one hand, the alpaca was domesticated for wool production. So only animals with a very fine fiber structure were selectively bred with one another. Additionally, alpacas were originally used also for their meat. Llamas, on the other hand, were selectively bred for very strong stature as they were used as pack animals. And potentially also considering that pack animals need to be cooperative and somehow yeah, rely on your orders. So to say they were also selectively bred for very cooperative behavior in a way. And given these different backgrounds between alpacas and llamas, this also dictates how they interacted with humans. So considering that alpacas were selectively bred to produce wool, um, they were also kept only very loose contact to humans, meaning that they were kept in semi-free ranging conditions around the villages, and they were only herded in for shearing once or twice a year, but otherwise had very limited human contact. Llamas, on the other hand, had very intense human contact. They went on trade caravans, which took several weeks or months, and yeah, daily interacted with the humans or were led by the humans on the halter. Um, so given these different selection pressures, this might have also affected how they interact with humans or how sensitive they are to human behavior per se. So alpacas, as I already said, were selected for very fine fiber structures, so physical trait, whereas llamas were potentially also selected for cooperativeness. So directly when they interact with humans, that they are cooperative, but not aggressive and are following humans um, yeah, rather voluntarily. And in this study that I'm going to present now, we wanted to find out whether llamas and alpacas are able to learn socially from conspecifics and humans um, to perform a detour behavior. And so since both species show a similar social organization and face similar ecological problems, we would predict that both learn socially also from conspecifics. Um, Based on the domestication hypothesis, we would predict that domesticated animals are more sensitive to human social behavior than wild species. So we would predict that both llamas and alpacas are able to learn socially from humans as well. However, what is the influence of the selection for different traits, so fiber structure and cooperativeness, 
on the sensitivity to human social behavior. Here we will predict if the selection purpose actually affects the social learning performance, that llamas are better in learning from humans since they were selectively bred for cooperative behavior compared to alpacas, which were bred only for a physical trait, but not for behavior. Okay, to test this, we visited six different farms in Germany. We exclusively visited farms that kept animals for tracking purposes because these animals were already quite well trained and yeah, able to interact also with unfamiliar people. We tested 43 adult llamas and 32 adult alpacas of various breeds and also of various age. So it ensures sufficient motivation to solve the task, but also to yeah, interact with us. We had two inclusion criteria. On the one hand, the animals needed to have a very basic training, meaning that they were, or they, they were required to wear a halter and also being used to walk with unfamiliar people on a leash. Additionally, um, they needed to be food motivated since the task involved walking towards food um, this yeah, basic food motivation was necessary. So we assessed this prior to the test and set the criterion that they needed to eat from a bowl filled with their familiar food three times in a row. And this led already to the exclusion of 11 llamas and 11 alpacas. Okay, to assess social learning, we used the often used detour task in which we had two metal hurdles that were arranged in a V-shape. And in the back of these hurdles, we placed a food bowl with, filled with familiar food. We had on the one hand um, a handler that was responsible for capturing and releasing the animals. And we had an experimenter that was responsible for baiting the bull and showing the, the demonstration in case of the human demonstration. Importantly, both handler and experimenter were unfamiliar to the individuals. So we set up uh, a test area next to the um, home stable of the animals. And we needed to ensure that the animals had visual contact to their conspecifics. And so um, to ensure that the animals had this visual contact, we um, set up the test arena directly next to the stable, meaning that here in the back of the area, the familiar conspecifics um, were present. Obviously, to exclude that these not involved or uninvolved um, conspecifics were already learning something by observing the animals performing the test. In this era, we only had individuals that were not participating in the study. Then we set up three experimental groups and the animals were randomly assigned to either of these groups and it was balanced between and within farms. On the one hand, we had a control group in which no demonstrations took place. Then we had a group with a human demonstration in which the experimenter walked along the hurdles towards the food bowl. And we had a conspecific demonstration in which a trained conspecific performed the detour behavior before the test subject was allowed to solve the task. We performed three trials and always in the very first trial, a demonstration took place. So either a human walking along the hurdles or a conspecific, whereas in the control test, uh, the first trial was not different from the the last two trials. Obviously, for the conspecific demonstration, we needed conspecific demonstrator, and these needed to be trained beforehand. So we selected one to two demonstrators per farm that um, needed, or according to two selection criteria. On the one hand, we selected animals with an intermediate position within the dominance hierarchy, according to the owner's assessment. And we selected only animals that were food motivated and easy to train. Then we used a stepwise training, step training procedure, meaning that we, we baited the food bowl, placed it first a bit to the side, then here, then here, and releasing the animals always in between until the food bowl was at the very end position. Um, here we set two training criteria before we considered the training success, successful. On the one hand, um, the animals needed to, yeah, to participate in a um, consistent way, meaning that they needed to detour the hurdles using the same route as during, the, fir during the, the first trial in at least two repetitions. And here we ended up with some problems. So we trained 11 alpacas and 11 llamas, but only four alpacas reached this criterion and none of the alpacas four llamas and none of the alpacas, sorry. 
And this was mainly due to, on the one hand, very low food motivation in case of the alpacas, and they also got very easily distracted, meaning that they could not focus on the task for a prolonged duration of time. Other problems, in particular with some of the llamas, were that they did not perform consistently, meaning that they randomly switched sites um, for performing the detour. And so obviously having no alpaca demonstrators, we could not test the alpacas in the conspecific condition. Um, here I want to show you how those different conditions looked like. So on the one hand, in the control condition, we had the demonstrator shaking the football, uh, the experimenter shaking the football, walking backwards and standing motionless. Whereas you can see in the back, the um, uninvolved conspecifics just standing there. And the animals always had 60 seconds to reach the food bowl. In the human demonstration, we had the, the experimenter walking towards the animal around the fence, shaking the food bowl and then retracting. Okay, and in the conspecific demonstration, we had the conspecific demonstrator that was released first, then walked to the football, was taken out of the test enclosure, and then the subject was released. The football was baited in between, obviously, so that food was present in it again. So uh, we analyzed the videos using the Boris software and we noted the number of successful trials out of the three trials that were presented. Um, then we coded the latency to reach the food from being released until either 60 seconds had passed or until the animal reached the food bowl. We also um, coded the duration of scanning behavior and scanning was here defined as standing motionless but moving the head to either side and we used this as a sign of distraction or a lack of attention. Then we also coded the duration of reaching behavior and this was defined as extending the neck across the hurdles towards the football and we used this as a sign of either inhibition problems or generally food motivation. We analyzed the data using a generalized linear mix model with a binomial error distribution. As response variable, we set the number of successes and failures. And as fixed effects, we entered an interaction between condition and species, trial number, so one, two, three, and H. To control for repeated testing, we set the animal ID as a random effect. Um, additionally, we ran a Cox proportional hazards model to analyze the latency to reach the food reward, but I'm not going to explain this um, in this talk. Um, for the um, other behaviors that we coded, we used a linear mixed model looking on the one hand at vigilance and the fixed effects condition, species, success, and age, and reaching behaviors with the same fixed effects. Here again, we said the animal ID is a random effect and to control for the different length of the trial duration, we set an offset term, including the log of the trial duration. So here you can see the um, results, in particular, the number of successful trials plotted against the different test conditions with control, human demonstration and conspecific demonstration. In gray, we have the alpacas, in green, we have the llamas. In red, you can see um, the respective mean and standard deviation. So generally looking at the, the plot, we can see that both llamas and alpaca, uh, both alpacas and llamas were very unsuccessful in the control condition. But we found a species condition interaction, which was mainly due to um, the human condition, in which the alpacas performed significantly worse compared to the llamas. So to further analyze the data, we split up the data set and analyzed each species separately. And here we found that um, the alpacas did not improve their performance after having observed the human demonstrations, so meaning that those two conditions were um, um, non-significant. And for the llamas, we found that um, they, were, they performed worse in the control condition and significantly better in the human condition and also in the conspecific condition. 
Um, looking at which site the animals used for detouring the hurdles, we found that they did not consistently use the same site as the demonstrator has shown before, had shown before. And also we found no effect of age and the animals did not improve their performance across trials. For well, the other behaviors we found on the one hand for the vigilance behaviors that um, less vigilant individuals were more successful. And um, we found that um, in particular in the control condition, the animals were more vigilant compared to the human condition. Whereas there was no condition, with, uh, no difference between the control condition and the conspecific condition. Generally, llamas were more vigilant compared to alpacas, and older individuals were somehow more vigilant than younger ones. For reaching, we found that animals that showed more reaching behaviors, that um, those individuals were also more successful. Um, there was no, no significant effect for condition and age, but llamas reached more often across the hurdles compared to alpacas. So what does this tell us? So on the one hand, having shown that um, llamas and alpacas were generally, uh, or generally, were generally not able to solve the task without demonstration, which is on the one hand good, and on the um, other hand, um, maybe not so good because only 20% of the llamas and 50% of the alpacas were able to solve the detour without demonstrations, which is a quite low number. This is good because um, social learning is most likely to occur in situations that are maybe too difficult to solve by trial and error learning. So the situation was most likely, or yeah, was best to elicit maybe social learning, but potentially also the task was just too difficult. And we found that, um, or based on our results, we could show that llamas use information from humans and conspecifics to solve the detours since their performance improved um, compared to the control condition. And looking at the, the type of social learning that was involved, we can say that imitation most likely did not occur because the animals did not use the same route as the demonstrator, at least not the majority of individuals. Um, however, emulation might be an explanation for our results, as um, the individuals reached the same goal as the demonstrator. However, they used a slightly different strategy, like using the different site to detour the hurdles. But additionally, local enhancement might also explain our results, because um, the demonstrator might have drawn the attention of the um, subject towards the football or towards the area behind the hurdles. Um, we are pretty certain that social facilitation has not played a big role because, um, as you saw in the videos, during all conditions, there were always conspecifics in the back of the arena. And so, um, yeah, the social facilitation effect should have been the same for all conditions. It's most likely that there is a combination of these different social learning mechanisms at work. But with this rather simple um, detour task, it is not really possible to disentangle these mechanisms involved. Um, in order to be able to disentangle these mechanisms, it would be necessary to include, for example, a ghost condition in which the food is moved along the hurdles without any human or non-human animal involvement. Um, additionally, one could test um, other social learning task like manipulation task or two-way action task, which would allow to yeah, look at more detailed behavior that would allow to draw conclusions regarding the underlying type of social learning. Nonetheless, we could show that alpacas did not improve their performance after having observed a human demonstration. And so based on this, one might infer that maybe alpacas are not able to learn socially, but we have to consider that we could not test them with a conspecific, and it's very likely that they would have shown social learning if a conspecific condition would have been possible. Um, nonetheless, all of these results are kind of still in line with the domestication hypothesis, which we, or which we referred to in the very beginning, but which state that um, such a domestication for different purposes is causing this differential sensitivity to human social behavior. 
However, I put a question mark here because there are several confounding factors that we need to take into account before we can draw any conclusions. And as I said, on the one end, it might be the domestication, so the sensitivity to humans, but also trainability and handling might influence the performance, in particular species specific differences in these traits. And so when we talk to the farmers, they often said that llamas are much easier to train compared to alpacas. And we found the same when we set up a yeah, large scale questionnaire study asking llama and alpaca owners how well trained the animals are and how easy they think training the animals is. And here we found the same, meaning that llamas are much more easy to train compared to alpacas. So it might be that the alpacas were just somehow stressed by being handled by unfamiliar humans that they performed so much worse in the task. An additional factor that um, we could also show looking at the behaviors was that food motivation seems to play a big role. And so we found that llamas are much more food motivated because they or are most likely more food motivated because they um, showed so much more reaching behavior compared to the alpacas. And if we take the reaching behavior as a proxy for food motivation, this might explain the results, meaning that llamas are also generally more food motivated compared to alpacas. Another factor that needs to be taken into account is attention. And um, we can show with the result that less vigilant individuals are somehow more successful because they can focus more on the demonstration and are not distracted by other aspects of the environment. Um, yeah, we could show that uh, llamas are more or uh, are more vigilant compared to alpacas, which does not really fit into this explanation, but definitely attention needs to be taken into account when um, analyzing social learning in a comparative context. Another aspect that uh, needs to be considered is neophobia. And so it might be that, for example, alpacas are more neophobic than llamas. So maybe the alpacas were really neophobic of humans or of the herders or something, and this might have hindered their learning performance. Nonetheless, based on our results, we can conclude that llamas, but not alpacas, use social information to solve the detour. And they can use social information from humans, but also from conspecifics. Emulation or local enhancement are the likely explanations, and imitation most likely did not occur. And furthermore, um, domestication for cooperativeness might explain the species differences, and we need to take into account that neophobia, motivation, attention, but also general problem solving capacities might influence our results. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention, and I want to thank my co-authors in particular, and Katrin Pahl, for helping in conducting the study and also um, Uta König from Boston for yeah, helping in writing up the manuscript. And obviously I want to thank all the alpaca and llama farmers for participation and all the llamas and alpacas for taking part in the study. And I'm happy to receive your questions. Thanks Desiree for the, for the fascinating talk. Um, we're happy to take questions via the chat box or if you have a question, uh, and want to state it live, just raise your virtual hand and uh, we will pick you up. Um, it might take a little bit of time until the first questions pop in. So I'm just starting right away. You already uh, mentioned that at the very, um, at the very end again, that vigilance was associated with poor performance. So the more vigilant animals were, the poorer they performed on the detour. But llamas that outperformed the alpacas were in general more vigilant than, yeah, than the alpacas. How, mm -hmm. how do we explain this, this, this uh, interaction effect that, that in general, speaking for llamas, the more vigilant individuals uh, were the worse or performed worse, but uh, you still see these uh, species differences in the opposite direction. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> so we were also wondering about this. Um, it's a bit difficult to explain, but I think it might be due to general species differences in um, 
and vigilant. So it might be that llamas just in general are much more vigilant compared to alpacas. And so very highly vigilant um, llamas make up a big e effect compared to alpacas, which are just generally much less vigilant. So it might be driven by these on the one hand, the, the big species differences, but on the other hand, also by individual differences, in particular in regard to the llamas. Thanks. And the, the, the poor thing about this is that really there's not much known about um, the behavior of llamas and alpacas, in particular in a cooperative way. So um, yeah, we can only assume that this that we that there are species differences in these behaviors, but we definitely need to run more studies in order to be certain or to rule out that this is actually the fact or that this might be an explanation. Thanks, Desiree. Uh, just a quick follow up on this um, in terms of general species differences. Did you or did you do or did you plan to conduct any? let's say, human approach test, novel human test with alpacas and llamas to actually validate whether there might be some differences in emotional reactivity or in other human directed traits. Yeah, definitely. That's planned for sure. <laughs> Um, and I think it will also be interesting to not just look at, at human directed behaviors, but also at sociality in total. So it might be that alpacas have a much tighter group cohesion or just much more social compared to llamas so that we are somehow able to rule out that such general differences in sociality are actually governing these processes, but that they're really somehow, yeah, due to um, or only related to in the human context or due to human social behavior, but not due to conspecific sociality per se. Thank you. Um, there's the first question coming in from Rachel. Um, she's asking whether you plan uh, experiments if these species are able to follow human pointing gestures. Yeah, we, we initially, when we uh, planned the study, it was also um, the, the alternative. So either looking at pointing gestures or looking at social learning. And um, so it's something that we definitely plan, but I'm really happy that we started with the social learning because we encountered some problems, I would say. So it wasn't that easy to um, keep or to, to collect the llamas and alpacas, keep them in a steady place and also keep their prolonged attention. So we found that they get distracted quite easily and that they're not focused on a task for a prolonged duration of time. And I think for the pointing study, you need their attention for, for some time and also for repeated trials. It might be a bit difficult. So this is something that we definitely plan, but we need to think of um, a way of how to perform the task, taking the species specific behaviors into account. Thanks. Uh, there's another question from Katarina um, asking uh, whether your animals that you tested were all male or all female and how old they in general were. We had a mix of males and females, but it was generally um, for, for the llamas, it was quite well balanced, but for the alpacas, I think it was a bit male biased. Um, and we had various ages. So I think it was ranging from two years up to 18 years. Thanks. Uh, there, there are two more questions coming in. Uh, one from Abby uh, asking about whether you found any pronounced individual differences. So uh, I guess some, some individuals that uh, performed act really, really good, like were really attentive, paying attention, uh, weren't straight the same direction, or other individuals that were just distracted in all the trials. Yes, most definitely. So we had some really, I mean, you saw the videos, those were the perfect example of animals really using the human social behavior to detour the, the, um, the fences. And there were really some that did so very well and also that we could train very well to be the demonstrator individuals. Whereas other individuals coming from the same group, having had the same training, performed really poorly. They were super distracted or, you know, not really interested to participate or they were interested, but they just got stuck in front of the fence and then yeah, gave up in a way. So there were definitely really strong individual differences also uh, if we look only at the same farm. Thank you. Uh, Bert is asking, uh, as she says, the, this stupid non-relevant question, did they spit <laughs> during the task? No, no, so they really, do not spit that often. So it never happened that they tried to spit at us or anything. It's really much more in a 
con specific context. So if a subordinate is coming too close or um, if a dominant just wants to go straight ahead and wants to be tested next, we, we saw that they sped at each other, but never directed at us. Uh, this, with the, with the individual differences, this also reminded me on some of the goats that we tested in similar paradigms. And I was wondering whether I saw the hurdles were quite high, but whether any individuals tried or or succeeded in jumping over the hurdles, whether this was in a, a strategy as well. No, they did not jump over it. Even though for for the llamas, it was really um, yeah. At, if you look at the picture, it was like at their at this level. So I'm sure they could have jumped. No, they did not jump over it, but we had two individuals that managed to insert the head through the hurdles and towards the football, and we needed to exclude them, but they did not jump, just tried this different alternative strategy. Yeah, this sounds oddly familiar with <laughs> just mm -hmm. uh, getting the head through the hurdle. Um, there's another question from Jackie. Um, in North America, llamas are often used as guards for alpacas. Would it be useful if the alpacas follow the llamas in performing the task? Yeah, I'm sure that it would be useful. Um, but it's um, yeah, I know that they're that, that llamas are used as um, guard animals. Also, not I'm not sure if I ever heard that they also guard alpacas, but that they guard sheep, for example, and defend them from wolves or you know, other predators. And um, I think this is a bit different because they are used as it's often they're used as one adult male within the group and it's there are no conspecific llamas that they can interact with so it might be that they are behaving more alpaca like in this context or more sheep like um, but definitely it would make sense if they follow this individual or if they yeah copy foraging choices or whatever obviously not copying attacking the the predator but they would be yeah, definitely interesting to look at, yeah. And there's a follow-up question by Abby. Um, how can you account for individual differences in future learning studies? Do you just need to increase your sample size? Yeah, I think that's one solution, increasing the sample size. Um, I think one solution would also be to um, repeatedly test individuals coming from the same farm that have like a similar training background or also to conduct additional tests like neophobia test or um, human avoidance test or whatever and taking these individual measurements into account when looking at the individual performance in the test. Great, thanks. Thanks, Desiree. Um, there are no more questions in here. Um, just a quick last one. Uh, um, how many, or, or did you run, uh, you mentioned that you sent out questionnaires to the Lama and Apaka owners. Did you run any uh, additional uh, behavioral studies with these individuals or other Lamas and Apakas? And if yes, which ones? No, not yet. It's definitely planned for the future. And um, yeah, definitely many more studies are planned because I think there's super interesting model species like coming or bringing in a different taxa into the whole whole game of the usual suspects of domesticated species that we, we test here. And the, the questionnaire study was somehow um, separate from this one in which we um, yeah, collected data about the behavior and training of these individuals using a worldwide um, quest, so to say. And these particular animals that participated in the study did not take part in the questionnaire. So we do not have this overlap in data. Okay, thanks. Thanks uh, a lot. And thanks again, of course, for presenting your research here. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks everyone for joining us for today's webinar. Um, I just give a quick heads up on the next webinar on March the 21st. Um, it's going to be about the Open Science Initiative uh, Peer Community in Animal Science, uh, and we will have as a speaker Rafael Muniz Tamayo from INRE in France, uh, who is going to talk about and, and give us a walkthrough about this initiative. Uh, so again, Desiree, for today, thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you so much for the for the uh, yeah for the for the slides and for this uh, for for discussing the results with us. So I'm wishing everyone a nice evening or have a good day, depending on the time zone you're in.
拜拜。Bye.